Well, good morning. morning. How are you all doing today? Wonderful. Wonderful. Great. Awesome, man. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, hey, we're in week two of our series on mission, and, and you know, this whole series about is about as, as us as Christ followers, as followers of Jesus, we're all called to actually be on mission. The, the problem is most of us as Christ followers think that everyone else should be on mission instead of us. You know, kind of like I talked last week, we talked about, you know, the final command of Jesus before he sent into heaven was the Great Commission, you know, to, to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I've taught you. And unfortunately for a lot of Christians, it's become the great omission. Oh, well, that's the pastor's job. That's someone else's job. You know, instead of us actually doing what Jesus called us to do. And, and I said, you know, throughout this whole series, we're going to be looking at different commands that Jesus has given us. That us as Christ followers, as saying that, hey, Jesus is the Lord of my life. I'm going to do what he calls me to do. Well, these are things he calls us to do. And, and like I said, unfortunately, we seem to fall short. And, and, and you know, you're not alone. I fall short the same way as everybody else. And, and, and today we're going to look at a command that, especially in today's time, I think is really hard. That, that whole in John chapter 15, love one another, you know, it's easy to love one another when it's reciprocated, you know, where, hey, they love me, so I love them, and, but then we all have those people, and we kind of say, Pastor, do, did Jesus really mean we got to love this person? Well, yeah, he meant it. The, the problem is we kind of put our own level of love, hey, I'm, I'm going to love this person a little different than I'm going to love this person. But Jesus clearly tells us to love one another. So we're going to dig into that today. But along with that, I've got to ask the question. Do people really know that you belong to Christ? As we think about this whole series on mission, do, do people know that you're a Christ follower? In other words, do people see Jesus in you? As you go through your normal everyday life, do people really see Jesus in you? And I think for most of us, we'd say, sometimes. Some of us may say, well, I wish they saw Jesus a little more often. For some, you're going to be like, man, they see Jesus all the time. Even when mosquitoes bite me, they go away singing the blood of Jesus. They're like, so they just know I'm full of Jesus. Yeah, we all got this different level, but, but I, I, I think back to in Exodus, and when Moses comes down from Mount Sinai, and remember he had the glory of God shining on his face to the point that he actually had to put a veil over his face because the glory of God shone in his face. That's my prayer, that when I walk up to someone that the glory of God just is shining on me so bad they like need to put on sunglasses. But unfortunately, I haven't run into a Christian yet who's like that, where the glory of the Lord just shines on them, where they got to put a veil on their face. And and even as the pastor, I I fall short of that. Because there's days and times in my life where I may not show the glory of God. I may not people may not see Jesus in me. And I know throughout my life, and you know, y'all know my story from a little kid, you know, I, I knew who Jesus was. I accepted him when I was 18 years old, was baptized in a creek in North Carolina, started living my life for Jesus, kind of fell off the wagon, got back on. And, and still throughout all that time, I know there's times I failed. There's times that people haven't seen Jesus in me. And unfortunately, it, it, it happens in life. We work in a world that don't want to know about Jesus, so the last thing they want to do is really see Jesus in us anyways. But, but the reality is, is as Christ followers, and the big idea kind of for today is this, 
Those who have experienced great love are capable of great love. Now think about that. We have experienced the greatest love of all through Jesus Christ, so therefore we should be capable of great love also. And, and I think as Christ followers, we should be like a mirror. And, and what I mean by a mirror is that we should reflect God's love to everyone, you know, everyone that we come in contact with. Now, of course, that everyone is a, really, pastor, you just don't know my coworker. You don't know my boss. Pastor, you don't know how my husband is sometimes. I love him, but man, it's cheaper to keep him. <laughs> That's pretty sad when they actually look at each other. <laughs> but, but it's what we're called to do. We need to reflect God's love like that, like, like a mirror. You know, we talked about it on Wednesday night at Bible study, but, but to see that reflection and for the world to see Jesus in you. And that's what we're going to look at today in John chapter 15. So if you have a Bible, you can open it up. We're going to be in John chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. If you don't have a Bible with you, there is one in the back of the pew. The Bible in the back of the pew is on page 1,243. Or break out your Galaxy phones. You notice I didn't say iPhones. You know, bite of a fruit. Just saying, just... Of course, the sound booth's back there laughing because I've been talking about getting a Mac computer. So they're like, oh no, the pastor's going to take a bite of the forbidden fruit. Any, anyways, we're not going there. Go not going there. Everyone in here who's got an Apple phone saying, don't go there, pastor. Anyways, so we're going to be in John chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. As always, uh, it will be on the on the screen, and I'd ask you to please all rise for the reading and the hearing of God's Word. And go ahead and read with me. As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be complete. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce fruit, and that your fruit should remain, so that whatever you ask in the Father, may he will give you. This is what I command you, love one another. The word of the Lord. Praise be to God. You may be seated. You know, it's funny, I like to ask, hey, read with me, and then I'm actually listening to people reading, and then it messes up my own reading. <laughs> yeah, I still fall short. I still fall short. So, uh, as we look at this, we, we can know that the love of God in Christ, that we, we should be reflecting this to the world. So, of course, the, the, the silly question would be this, if... Why was Jesus willing to go to the cross to die for you? And you think about who you are and the things that you've done in your life. And, and of course, we know the answer. Jesus willingly went to the cross to die for you and me because of love. The love that he had for you and I, the love that he had from the Father for us, had him to willingly go to the cross to die for our sins. And it was all because of the love that he had for us. And, and then I got to ask you, know, why would Jesus love us? Why would Jesus love, you, you think about even at the time, he, he showed his love for people who were persecuting him. He showed his love for people who would lie against him, people who would spit on him, antagonize him, uh, actually beat him, make him wear thorns for a crown, 
nail him to a cross, but yet he still loved them. He was willing to go to the cross, and, and, and even, you, you know, he, he loved because of the Father's love in him. He never lost that love of the Father. So because he never lost that, he was willing to take up his cross. He was willing to do what he called us to do. And, and I love how, how he says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. You know, I think about that. If you've ever read, like, psychological profiles of of people in prison or people on death row, one of the traits or, or profiles that they always say about them is that they were incapable of love. And, and I really think about that, like, how can someone be incapable of love? And then I kind of think about people's upbringing. You know, some people, when they never see the love of their parents, they don't know what love is. They don't know how to express love. Or maybe there was never love between the parent and the child. So so they really don't know how to show love. And I think a lot of times, you know, unfortunately you see that happen, that people are incapable of showing love because they never experienced it growing up. You know, I was fortunate enough, I, my mom loved dearly. Um, you know, I was raised, you all know, by a single mom, and, and she loved all four of us kids. I was the only boy, so I will tell you she loved me more. Just saying. I was Kenny do no wrong. Ask my sisters, they'll tell you. Of course, I didn't do no wrong. Just in mom's eyes, I did no wrong. But see, my mom loved. And, and even though I didn't have that father figure, I learned to love because of my mother. The, the way that she not only loved us kids, but the way she loved anyone she came in contact with. And, and so... This whole being incapable of love, I've had friends who came from divorced families, they didn't have parents, uh, their parent or their mom or dad was always out working, so they're kind of raising themselves, and, and you just see the lifestyle that they live, and because they never really had that love, you find they kind of fall into that same trap, and they're not able to show love where they're incapable of love. But now, see, I think as us as Christ followers, we've, we've not only seen God's mercy, we've seen his grace, but we've also felt his love. We, we've felt the love of Christ even when we didn't deserve it. And, and I think that as because of that fact that we've felt the love of God, that we all should be capable of love. Now, remember, none of us will be perfect, and none of us will have that perfect love until we see Jesus face to face, but we should at least, on a daily basis, be lovable to others and show that love like he calls us to do, and instead of being incapable of love, actually be loving. You know, I, I look at here, you know, the whole story of Jesus, and we know that the, the Father loved the Son. From creation, from eternity, all the way through eternity. You know, from beginning to end, alpha, everything. He, he loved him so much, but then I think about, he had to go to the cross. Even as much as God loved him, he had to go to the cross. And I really think about, you know, it's something that he had to do. He had to go in order to show his love for us. He had to go to the cross. And I wonder during that time, I'm like, man, did, did God love me more than he loved Jesus? Because Jesus had to suffer for me. And, and, and I really got thinking, man, I don't think God ever loved me more than Jesus. I think he kind of loved me the same, but how could he do that? You know, I think about my own son. There is no way in the world that I would allow my son to go through what Jesus went through. I would fight tooth and nail or I'd put myself in his place. But yet God allowed this to happen. And so I, I got to thinking, I said, you know, it kind of reminds me of a story I heard. There was a dad who had to take his son in for an emergency surgery. And, and they get to the hospital, and, and the doctors are prepping everything, and they're getting ready to take the son into surgery, and his son's crying and don't want dad to leave. No, dad, you got to stay with me. You got to stay with me. And dad's like, I, I can't. I can't go in there with you. And, and the kids like crying. And as they go to move in, the dad has to let go of his hand. 
Now, the reality is the dad didn't love him anymore. He didn't love him any less. Ultimately, it's something that had to be done. It was emergency surgery. If the surgery didn't happen, there would have been death. So the dad had to let go, but he never stopped loving him. And I think of the same way that, that God did that for when Jesus went to the cross. He never stopped loving him. He just had to let go because it had to happen. It had to happen for your salvation. It had to happen for my salvation. It had to be that atonement for sin because it required the death of his son. So it's something that had to happen. I don't think he ever loved him any less. But at the same time, you see the love of the father and how much he loved each one of us and how we should reciprocate that same love to others that we come in contact with. The fact that he was willing to go to the cross, and even while going to the cross, he never forgot the love of the Father. Think about it. Jesus' first words on the cross were, forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they're doing. His last words on the cross, Father, I give my spirit. The actual, actual wording, because I def definitely said that wrong. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So his very first and last words were focused on the Father. They were focused on God. They were focused on that love that God had for him and that same love that God has for each one of us. And I think sometimes in this life we forget about that focus of the Father. We forget that not only did he love his son, he loves each one of us. Loves each one of us dearly. That he was actually willing to send his own son to a cross to die for our sins. And it's something that had to happen. It, it had to happen in order for us to have the salvation and that relationship with God the Father. I like the scripture goes on it says, Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. That's how you know God loved us. Because God the Son laid down his life for each one of us. So I got to ask, do people see Jesus in your face? Do people see Jesus in your face because of the confidence that you have in a loving God? Do you have that joy that he talks about? That joy that is just unbelievable in life, that joy that people just are like, Man, you're way too joyful. You know, here's the reality. Jesus loved us enough that, that we should be able to go through life and whatever struggle we're going through, be able to say, hey, you know what? I'm okay. I can find joy in this because you know what? Jesus loves me. It's, yesterday, we're out there doing the, the farm share, and it's funny, I was talking to someone, and we were talking about future sermon series that we're going to be doing, and someone made the comment, well, I know Jesus loves me. And we actually started singing the song, Jesus Loves Me This I Know Because the Bible Tells Me So. And it was so neat because here I'm out there with people who don't come to this church, don't know what their relationship is, but the fact that they knew Jesus loves them. And they remembered that song from when you were a kid and we used to sing it. I remember singing it as a kid. I remember singing it to my own kids. And to this day, the realization that I know Jesus loves me. You know why? Because the Bible tells me he does. You know why else I know? Because I feel him each and every day. I know his love that he has placed towards me each and every day. When I feel him moving me, when I, that's speaking to me, speaking through me, taking time in his word, taking time having conversations with him through prayer, I feel that love. Unfortunately, I don't always give that love to others. But I sit back and I realize that no matter what, I know whatever I'm facing, Jesus loves me. 
whatever I'm going through in life, and he's never going to stop loving me. No matter what hardship I have, no matter what I may be going through, no matter what you may be going through, it's the realization we can sit here and say, no, no matter what happens to me, God still loves me. What a way to approach the day. You want to talk about having joy? Actually, every day, every time you go, you know what? It don't matter what happens. God loves me. I'm good for the day. Hey, I got to go to meet with my boss, and it's probably not going to go well. But you know what? At the end of the day, Jesus loves me. I'm good. My boss may not like me, but that's okay. I'm good. Jesus loves me. Jesus is my, I work towards him. My work goes towards him, not towards my boss. Well, of course, he is my boss, so that's a whole different ballgame. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the realization of, of just knowing that he's never going to stop loving you, no matter what you do, he's never going to stop loving you. He, you're still going to be able to go to him and, and understand that because of the love you have for him, because of the joy that he brings you, that's where that testimony of yours starts coming in. As we talked about last week, it's, it's that telling people, hey, this is who I was. This is the things I was doing, and then I met Jesus, and after I met Jesus, this is what he's done in my life. That joy that comes, that love that comes with him, that becomes your testimony that you're able to tell other people about. And that's what we're called to do, and, and we're able to do that because of his love, because of his grace, because of his peace, and the joy that we, we should have because of him. The reality is some days we wake up and we're not too happy. We're angry, we're grumpy, we continue through the day angry and grumpy, and we have this bad witness for Jesus, and, and people start looking at like, what happened to you? We're still in the human flesh. There's going to be days we have bad days, we may not feel good, we may whatever it may be, we're not having a good day, but understand that even when you're having that bad day, Jesus still loves you. He still loves you. He still cares for you. And all we got to do is tap into, hey, love one another. Let me do what he called me to do. I may not feel like it and understand that, you know, people can't see our relationship with Jesus. They can't see it because it's inside of us, but they can definitely feel it the way we treat them. So even if we're in a bad mood, we can still show the love of Christ. Sometimes we just have to say, hey, I know this may be bad. I may not be happy. I may not, but you know what? At the end of the day, Jesus loves me. And I can hold on to that and move forward through this day and, and take this and just say, I need to move forward and put this grumpiness behind me, go get some extra coffee, whatever it may be, but put the grumpiness behind you and move forward. And I've got to say, can people see Jesus in your face? Can they see his joy in you? My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Love each other as I have loved you. I think about that scripture and I think about, uh, unfortunately, you know, for the youth in the room, you guys probably see it. And even as adults, we see it. I remember as a kid, you know, there's always that, that one kid in school. And as soon as I say that one kid in school, someone comes to your mind. Yeah, I remember that one kid in school. You know, no one ate lunch with them. Everyone picked on them. You know, and, and then unfortunately, even from school, it kind of happens as we go through life. There's that maybe that one family member we don't want to hang out with. We do a family reunion. We hope they don't show up. You know, or or we've got that one coworker, or maybe that one person in church that man, I just don't want to sit by them. And, you, you, you know, we did it in school. You kind of alienated this person. You know, no one sat with them at lunchtime, and everyone picked on them. And, and maybe it's the same thing in the workplace of, well, I got to work with them, but 
That's it. I, I'm not going to let them know nothing about my life. I'm going to say hi, but I'm going to move on. You know, Jesus loves that person. And, and here's the reality. As a Christ follower, if, if we're going to be Christ-like, we should be able to feel and understand the pain that person's going through and, and realize that someone who's getting treated like that, they're actually kind of in this loneliness world anyways, that everything they do, they become accustomed to it, that they all of a sudden start shying away from people anyways because it's easier just to not be around somebody. I think of, you know, take some time, read John chapter 4, the, the Samaritan woman at the well, and you think about it, she comes out to the well in the mid part of the day. So it's hot, going to be sweaty, not going to be a good time. But you know why she does it? Because no one else is going to be there. No one else is going to be at the well. She can kind of take this loneliness. Hey, I, I don't want to be around people because what they do, I'm that one person. I'm that, I'm that person that people don't sit with at lunchtime. I'm that co-worker that no one talks to. I'm that person in church that's kind of odd and people avoid me, you know, as we go through this life. And, and, and so they take this time of being lonely and, and away from everybody else. And, of course, she goes there at noontime and, and here's this Jewish man sitting at the well. And she's not worried because he's a Jew and he would never, ever talk to a Samaritan. But what does Jesus do? Jesus speaks to her. Jesus shows her love that she's not getting. And remember, she isn't the, the best kind of person in town. She's been married five times. She's now shacked up with another man who wouldn't even put a ring on the finger. You know, so, so she's living this life that she shouldn't be living. And, and here, this Jewish man who should never talk to anyone talks to her and tells her things that she'd never been told by anyone. He took the time to show her love. He took the time, knowing she would be there at that time, to be who he's called to be. That's what we're called to do. That person that's that outcast, that person that's that loner, that person that we all know who we're talking about, needs that same thing that the Samaritan woman needed at the well. Needed to feel the love of Christ. And as Christ followers, that's what we're called to do. To show that love to one another, be Jesus with skin on in all that we do, and take those steps of obedience. And just love one another. See, someone in this room may have been that person. Yep, I'm that person no one ate with. Yep, I'm that person at work. Yeah, they don't come near me because I'm a, they call me a Jesus freak and they know I'm going to be preaching. Well, that's okay. Continue to preach it, but maybe just show, show the love of Christ. Make them want what you want. Well, make them want what you have. The reality is some of us, you know, it's, hey, they don't come near me because uh, I'm going to preach to them every single day. Maybe what they need is just for you to be in ear to listen. Maybe just be there for them. See, the reality is sometimes we just try and beat people over the head with a large print King James Bible. And you need Jesus, and we think we're going to beat them, Jesus into them. Well, you know what they need more than anything? They need you to be like Jesus with skin on, to be there to have that conversation and when you have that conversation and you treat them with love, that's going to open the door, not for you to beat them over the head with the Bible, but for you to tell them what the Bible says. But we can do it with love. We can do it with compassion. Because the reality is, if someone would have beat me at 18 years old over the head with a King James Bible, I still wouldn't be here today. Because that, that would have made me run more than anything. And unfortunately, I've seen that through life, especially in them small churches up in North Carolina. Yeah, I, like I said, the day I accepted Jesus, I swore 
that the pew I was sitting in was catching on fire. I swear that there was a burner going on that seat, and I had to get up and I had to move to the front and give my life to Jesus. And it was King James Version of the Bible, which I, you guys know I still, if I'm memorizing Scripture, I do King James only because it's poetic. I love the these and the thous. But the reality is when, when that preacher was up there preaching hellfire and brimstone, I literally felt it on my butt and I had to get up and repent of myself, repent of my sins and go and accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Now, I did that on a Sunday. But I will tell you, I truly didn't accept Jesus till the next day. And the reason I say that is because that was kind of this emotional moment. You know, the, the word was speaking to me. I was kind of on fire. I felt like I was going to be set on fire. I had to make that move. But see, the next night when I was out in the woods and I looked up at the stars and I saw that moon and I realized, man, he is so much bigger. All of my life going to church and being in church and knowing about Jesus really came to fruition that night when I was out there looking at his splendor. And I always tell you, we'll always say, that's when I really accepted Jesus because it was just a me and him conversation. And I was able to feel that love and that grace to know that, hey, th this is my creator and I wanted him to be the Lord of my life. Because I felt his love when we were one-on-one. -on -one. It wasn't about a movement inside the church. It was about that, that conversation that him and I had one-on-one. -on -one. And, and going into the next verse is, Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his brother. Jesus laid down his life for us. He goes on and then tells us that you are my friends. We have a friend in Jesus. And it's a friend better than any friend you have here on earth. And some of us have real good friends. We have friends that we've known since we we're, you know, little kids. And, and we still talk and we go on. But you know what? My, my friend in Jesus has been through more with me than the friend I grew up with. Because Jesus has been with me in my darkest times. Jesus has been with me when I've been hurting and I didn't tell a friend. Jesus has always been the one there for me. And, of course, Jesus tells us if we're his friend, that we do his commands. So we need to take those steps and love one another and be who he called us to be in one another. And, unfortunately, I want to let you know that I can't find a single rule in the Bible that tells us that we have to go sit with you-know-who at lunch. But I think it's Christ-like. Yeah, there, There's nothing in the Bible that says, you need to go sit with so-and-so. But if we're going to show the love of Christ and be, be Jesus with skin on, then it means we should automatically do it. Be different. Be the person that Jesus has called you to be. I think of Jesus says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. People who love Jesus and have Jesus love them need to do the same. Hebrews 12, 2 tells us, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus went to the cross with joy. Think about that. Jesus went to the cross with joy. That doesn't make sense, does it? But he did that with joy because of you and because of me. Willingly endured the cross because of us because he loved us that much. He was glad to do it, and I think that when we show kindness to others, 
it shows that same joy and that same love that Jesus had for us. Daring to be different than what society tells us to be. Daring to be who God called us to be instead of who the world wants us to be. The world needs love. The world definitely needs love. And the world is not going to give people the love of Jesus. Unfortunately, what is it in love in the world? It's all about things. It's all about possessions. It's all about power and greed. The love of Jesus is about being willing to die for your friend, being willing to put yourself out there and being Christ-like and showing that love for one another. It's so much different than the world. But we're called to be set apart. He says he chose us and that we should bear fruit. So if we're doing what he called us to do and we're loving one another and the fruit's going to last, because here's the reality, when we're showing love in this world today, people are going to want to know why. Why are you doing this? And then we're able to say, look, let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you what my Jesus did for me and the love that he showed me in everything he did, and we're able to show that goodness of God in what we do. And then guess what? People want a piece of that because we're different than the world, and people, man, I, I, I need a piece of what you got. And then you're able to actually start to bear fruit because you're able to plant those seeds, and then those seeds last. And, you know, we may never know till we get to heaven how many people we touch through one person? Yeah, how many times we planted a seed and, and we kind of forgot about it. We're like, man, I forgot I even talked to this person and one day we're going to get to heaven and we're going to see that this person accepted Jesus and, and then they maybe brought all these people along. Uh, I think of the guy who gave up his seat for Billy Graham to sit in that tent revival and all he did here, man, you, you sit in my seat. Allow Billy Graham to sit in that seat. Billy Graham accepts Jesus. And, and look at all the lives that were changed because of that. And it all came down to one person. And guess what? We don't know his name. But lives were affected because he showed the love of Christ by giving up his seat. I always, I always joke about it, man. Oh, I got to get to church early so no one gets in my, my seat. You know, the pew's got your name on it. This is my seat. And then so you come in and someone's sitting in your seat and all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, pastor said I can't be upset because someone's in my seat. And what do you do? You sit someplace else and in your mind, I can't believe they're in my seat. <laughs> next, week I'm next week I'm coming early. They ain't going to be in my seat. I'm going to make sure I go up and introduce myself to them. But next week I'm coming early. We'll come to church early next week, honey. We're going to be here early. Ain't no one getting in my seat. Isn't that crazy? And the worst thing is most of us know someone who's like that. Or you're even worse than that. Excuse me. That's my seat. <laughs> All of a sudden you pull the Sheldon, that's my spot. Really? Man, I, I want this house to be so full that when you get here, someone's sitting in your seat. Just for the simple fact that you got to be like, well, I either got to get here early or I'm going to find a new seat. But <laughs> that's a, they took my seat. I'm going to a new church. I'm going to go find a perfect church that's going to be imperfect the day I show up, but that's okay. <laughs> the reality is we need to show that love. And, and, and that love is not only in the world, but it's to each other, to our brothers and sisters in Christ. We should love each other even though we're unlovable. We, we need to show that love for each other. And, and you know, I remember as a kid, you know, always always in church. You know, like I, I've said before, as long as them doors were open, my mom dragged me to church. And I remember there were some kids in school and they'd always pick on me because I was always going to church. I, I was always going. It was either, you know, I, I was raised Catholic, so it was CCD classes, catechism classes. I was an altar boy, so preparing. So, I mean, I was always at church. And I remember I had some kids who always used to pick on me because I was the, the church kid. You know, I always wanted to be in church. And, and they used to pick on me, and then one of the kids was like, oh, did your mommy make you go to church? And I remember boldly standing there and saying, no, I go to church because I want to go to church. 
And, and I remember after that time for a little while, I never really got picked on about going to church because they realized something was uh, I wanted to do it. I wasn't being forced. No, my mommy didn't make me go to church, even though she drugged me every time the doors were open. Uh, but I wanted to do it. And, and I think about there's many things inside church and around church that people think we have to do. And, and I can honestly say I don't have to do, and we don't have to do any of it. It's things I want to do. You know, I, I, I can tell you, I don't have to come to church every day. Well, I'm the pastor, I kind of have to, but I don't have to come to church every day. I want to. I don't have to be a pastor. I spent many years in warehousing, could still go back to warehousing and logistics jobs, but, but I want to. I, I want to do what I'm doing. I, I don't have to give 10% of my income to, to kingdom work. I don't have to do that, but I want to. And I believe there's blessings associated with that. The other thing is, I, I, don't, I don't have to love people, but I want to. I don't have to pray for the sick, but I want to. I don't have to come out here on Tuesday night for a prayer group where we, we pray over everyone by name. I don't have to do that. But let me tell you, there is something about coming in here and praying over people that it just makes you want to do it. You know, that you come in here and you feel the Spirit and you're shaken by the movement of God when you see people healed, when you see people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, when, when, you, when you know that God is still moving, He's still in control. There's something about that that I want to do it. I don't have to do it. There's something about I don't have to get up and read God's Word every day, but let me tell you, I want to. And there's so many times I'll be reading God's word and it's like, man, I, I got stuff to do, but, you know, and I've read this story like 10 times, but man, I, I got to keep going. I got to turn that page and keep reading. I don't have to. I want to. We have these choices in the world today. We don't have to love the way Jesus wants us to, but we should want to. We should want to love the way that he loves because he loved you that much. Willingly died on a cross for you because he loved you. Because he loved you. So I got to ask, do people see Jesus in you? I said in the beginning, those who, of us who have experienced great love are capable of great love. Show the love that Jesus showed you. Be that mirror. Reflect God's love to everyone that we come in contact with. That's what we're called to do. Be a mirror into the world today. <clears throat> Be so full of Jesus, you need to put a veil over your face. That his glory is just shining through. That people are like, man, I don't know what it is, but I want what you got. Tell me, what is it that makes you different? And be willing to do what he calls you to do. Je Jesus loved and was willing to go to the cross to die for you. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we just thank you. We thank you for who you are and what you've done. Lord, as we take this time and do this in remembrance of you, we can't help but remember your love. The love that you had for us. And Lord, also remembering the commands that you gave us. Go and make disciples. Love one another as I have loved you. Lord, may we do what you call us to do. As we take time to remember the sacrifice that you made for us, how much love you showed for us, even yet while we were sinners. That you willingly went and died on a cross for us. Lord, that is love. Gave up your life for a friend. Lord, may we remember that we have a friend in you. And Lord, is anyone here that doesn't know you, Lord, that today would be the day of their salvation? that they would take the steps to make you the Lord of their life. 
so they can show others the love that you have. And Lord, may others see you in our face, in our expression, in our words, and in everything we do throughout this week. Lord, help us to be Christ-like in all that we do. And Lord, make this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks again for joining us here today at FBC Lantana for Church Online. And, and, and if, if you enjoyed what you saw today, I'd just like to ask you to go ahead, go to our website and, and help support this ministry as we try and outreach and reach the lost for Jesus Christ. And you can just go to our website, fbclantana.com slash give, um, and you can make an online donation right there. Again, I encourage you to get connected to a local church, and especially if during this message you felt compelled to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, definitely go tell somebody. Let someone know because that is the greatest decision you could ever make in your life. And, and from there, get connected to a local church. Hey, we would love to provide you with some resources with that. You can go to our website, fbclantana.com, and on the very front page, you say, give my life to Jesus. Click on there, and at the bottom of there, there's some links and some good information for you. And just wanted to say, welcome to the family.